So I saw the show on Monday for the first time in 16 years. Ooh. It was really something. Thank you for that. Um, you know, there's been a lot written about this show now. It has a sort of fabled history. There's a really uh, great story of um, Anthony and Lynn getting in trouble, I believe, with, with Tommy Kale for interrupting <laughs> our rehearsals with, with freestyle, of course. Um, but you know what, let's skip over that. I, I, think, I think that's been well chronicled. I would love to really talk about the present and what's going on now, because I have this kind of like burning question, like 16 years, that's a long time to invest in something. Overnight sensation. Overnight <laughs> sensation. Um, uh, but, but now, going from that weird black box theater where there may be 30 seats, I think, something like that. Uh, now there are sold out performances. And I think you are fundamentally changing the mindset of what people uh, think is socially acceptable to put on Broadway. Mm -hmm. So talk to me. Like, what in God's name were you thinking? No script, <laughs> no plot, no set. Jenny's one of our producers. So I, I would actually love to hear from her <laughs> what she thinks. Because it's a big question, right? The improv doesn't happen on Broadway. A fully improvised show is uh, is like Haley's Comet on Broadway. And the last one was like Mike Nichols and Elaine May. And that's 1962. Um, it's not 76 years later, but it's close. Uh, so, so yeah, I mean, what are you thinking putting an improv show on Broadway, Jenny? You're crazy. Um, well, you know, I think when you start anything, you, you don't, Although everyone has fantasies about what it could be, you don't launch into any project thinking it's going to be, this is what is going to happen. You have to honor what the project is in the moment. And in the moment, it was this brilliant improv show that we found. Um, I'm a co-founder of our, a theater called Ars Nova here Woo. in New York City. Um, and we were the first sort of sit down home for freestyle and we worked very closely for many years, really, developing the show. I mean, all of these guys had been been working and working on the show and doing this for a long time, but showing up, you know, I don't know if we did eight shows a week, but in the beginning we, we did quite seven. A, seven shows a week, being able to deliver and play with the different games within the show and see what worked best was really um, a testing ground in lots of ways. So we watched it develop. We, I mean, I've seen this show <laughs> I can't begin to count how many times. It is different every time. I never get tired of seeing it because it's different every time. And um, it has become, over the years, it's really been like a family. I mean, we've really all grown up together. And um, I've had the honor of watching these guys become extraordinary performers in their own right. And as I've, you know, with my other partners, uh, my husband, John Steingart, and Jill Furman, and we've really grown up as producers as well doing this. And so as we um, went through each stage, it just seemed right. And the last iteration of this was off-Broadway, and it was sold out and um, got beautiful reviews, and it felt like the time was now. Uh, and it only took 16 years. It only took 16 years, that's right. Overnight sensation, 16 years in the making. Um, but it, it really, everything aligned, and it's been, I always think like when doors sort of not just swing open, but like get blown off their hinges, you know that you're on the right path. And this has really been um, just the biggest labor of love, truly. I mean, it's been extraordinary to watch it happen and watch all of them, and then to bring in you know, these fabulous ladies who are, are the newest members, and it's just fantastic um, to have them as well. So it's great. And there, there's something about this that you're putting something on stage where everyone on stage is a maker. Um, they're not vessels, they're not interpreters, they're really makers. Maybe they're interpreters of <laughs> these people's lives a little bit, right? Yeah. Um, uh, and that must also uh, be unique, that everyone on stage is a maker. I, th I think so. I mean, I think that it's uh, certainly to watch people in the moment of creation, really. It's so inspiring. And um, that's, that's an honor to watch. Who hasn't seen the show yet? Most of the people. Most of the people. So they, don't, they probably don't even know what we're talking about. <laughs> 
<laughs> like, oh great, they did a thing. What 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 is the thing that they're talking about? <laughs> Sh- should 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 we, we maybe? Yeah. Maybe. All right. Well, why don't we do a little like sample of what we do? <laughs> yeah. Um, well, do you want to tee it up? It just so happened that we've been collecting some words Great. as people came in, just how they're arriving today. So cool. might I just pass this over? Actually, no, you hold on to it because we, we, have, we haven't seen these words yet, yeah? No, that's true. Okay, it's a little bit like a magic trick, right? You have to like set up the frame for it. So we haven't seen these words yet. They've, they've been written as you were entering. Uh, and we're going to do a little setting up because we have to have a beat first. So let's start with a beat. <laughs> start with we start with a beat and then Brad why don't you like give like one word at a time and young knees will start by doing a little something we call ciphering so anytime you're ready oh. All right, the word is pooping yeah I'm just a stoop kid sitting on the toilet guess I am pooping this just got a little no, but it's okay, we're gonna do it anyway, cause I'm doing the flow, we do the show, and here we go. Broda, what's the protocol? Tell me, baby, what's on your mind? Tell me what's going on, cause you look fine. Walking down the street, gonna get some food. Yeah, I'm really gonna ask, cause I'm in the mood. Last word for me, Tourette's. Yeah, Tourette's, yeah, I say what's on my mind. It just comes out, I don't know what I'm saying all the time. Yeah, I'm saying words, but what, what am I saying? Yeah, yeah, for Breeze, yeah, you know I am spraying it. Every, everywhere, cause you know it smells nice. It's winter, it's gonna be ice. Great, and let's now have uh, Arthur the Geniuses sing a hook of some Come kind. On. Uber Come stock. On. Come on. Oh Come man, on. I don't know what I was thinking. Bought some Uber stock and now my portfolio's sinking. <laughs> Actually, I don't know what's going on with them. That was a cheap shot, I will not pretend. And last word is kale. Kale, that's a vegetable you eat. Come on. Uh, kale, that's also a director on the street. Hey. Like kale. Great, and then I'll take a couple words. So go ahead and throw anything you want. Give me some Google words. Give me some good old Google words. Google word, Google word. Google word, Google word. Defining the relationship. All right, oh. yes. Obviously, doing some deep ish. I have just a project. I need some management to come correct. But where my PMs, where my ATMs, where my ruse crew, what you gonna do? I need some few of you to come and move some things, cause I can't do it without all of these bring in. Yes, we got a lot of heart. Thank you so much for doing your part. Nooglers, the Googlers, the TVCs. We're gonna do some FTEs and part time. Too. And anyway, I just went to Laplace to get a gorgeous Asian salad. What? <laughs> yeah. That was close, because the next one was... Ooh, settlers of Catan. Uh, uh, I give you wheat for lamb. <laughs> Beautiful. Settlers of Catan, wheat for lamb. Anyway. There we go. So in the show, there is this moment when... So that's what we do. Yeah, that's... They still don't get it. That's basically what I show still don't get it. In a nutshell. And in the show, there's this moment, right? There's this, there, there's this defined... I'm going to throw out some Google terms here. Um, <laughs> uh, well, first of all, I guess this would be to find a moonshot. 
Uh, that's what we would call this kind of. Ooh, are we at X all of a sudden? <laughs> oh. we are, uh, no one told you you're a secret project. Oh, wow. Freestyle loves it, loon, preem. <laughs> <laughs> Um, there's this, there, there's this like def very uncomfortable, unnerving to me maybe uh, moment of ambiguity, which is when after you come out and you first start seating the audience. Um, unlike any other Broadway show, well, most of them at least, there is this there's this other character that isn't playing. You don't know who's going to show up, right? Um, what uh, you know, this is uh, you know, Anissa. I'd love to hear. Like, what's going through your mind as you're hearing these words come out? You're not really sure where Anthony's going to be going with this. Nope. <laughs> and Anthony likes to pick some crazy things sometimes. Some, of Catan. Sometimes words, I don't even know what they mean. But, um, yeah, I mean, when, I'm, when that's happening, I'm just thinking, please be something good, please be something good, please be something I relate to and understand. And, I mean, sometimes it's not that. And you just have to take it and go and uh, use yourself to make up something. Um, but <laughs> Pooping. <laughs> Pooping, exactly. Uh, I mean, some things you relate to more than others. So, I mean, there, there, there are parts in the show where we are able to choose for ourselves. And it's really um, satisfying when you get something that you understand and can actually riff off of. Have you ever done just, you know, you've heard the word before, you know how to, what you're going to do with it, or no? We have pretty high standards of not repeating ourselves. Yeah. So we've done a lot of shows. We've done close to, as since the beginning, close to 1,500 shows. And we try very much not to pick the same word ever twice. You're not going to hear impeach being done yeah. these days. That's right. Everyone throws that one out. That's the first word we got. Or surprisingly, cheese? Cheese, lots yeah. Of cheese, lots of cheese. Lemonade. Lots of cilantro, uh, too. People don't like cilantro. Defenestrate has been the word that everyone calls out to be like, oh, no one's ever said this word before. I think it's the most yeah. called out word of our trip so far. Yeah. Like, why? We call that the look how smart I am moment. Yeah. Ah, it, you get masticate a lot. Yes. We do. I love that. We have to chew that one over a while, but <laughs> we generally get through it. Um, so, so there is a, a sort of guiding principle, the certain standard, as you as also MC are trying to bring to the table as well. Yeah, definitely. It's it's a curation process. I mean, uh, I don't know if anyone's familiar with a show that Darren Brown is doing right now called Secrets. Secret. Um, but if you go to see that show, you walk out and you're like, nope, the world is not what I thought it was. <laughs> Magic is real and that person can read minds. And it's a filtering process that's, that is built into a show. And so for us, because we've done so many shows, there's a lot of thin slicing that's going on. You know, Well, someone also looks like Malcolm Gladwell on her stage, so it works out well for us. Uh, but, but there's a lot of like using your gut and that neural network that you've built over many moons of doing this to say, what's going to be the most fruitful word or words or story to take? And how can we keep building them up? That Our whole show is about making our audience feel the best version of themselves by the time they walk out. And so, and so we have to kind of be the best version of ourselves as well. Mm -hmm. So for instance, if you get poop, you might do something different with it. Oh, that just did not sound right when it- Yeah, no, that's a good question, right? So we, and th I think there's some implications here around innovation and creativity, but how do we digest information? <laughs> Pooping. <Boy. laughs> um, there's a lot there, right? So P O O P, and then the I N G, the gerund of it all. So you know, you don't have to just hear a word in one way. You can hear, oh man, I took the O out and my pop can't stand, right? So I can like attack that in lots of different ways. It doesn't have to be a scatological joke. It can be something about uh, the the desire to pop poop and take the O out, scoop, like an ice cream shop. You know, like it, there's just lots of ways that you can, you can take these things apart. It, it doesn't have to be so straightforward all the time. Uh, so l l let me pivot a little bit and love to hear uh, uh, f from uh, maybe Chris over there, because you're, you're involved in the Freestyle Love Supreme Academy as well, right? Um, and and uh, it, it makes me think of this other question, which is, uh, there, it sounds like there are a bunch of mental models going on, a lot of uh, things that you're shifting around in your all's minds. Um, and in lieu of a script, a plot, et cetera, a score, 
um, that there is this habit of practice, this discipline, uh, this ability to go into details. How, how uh, are you all thinking about that? Well, we set up the Freestyle Love Supreme Academy. People are like, wow, he has a voice. <laughs> um, <laughs> I've never heard him speak before. I will beatbox translate for we set up the academy. <laughs> yeah. the Freestyle Love Supreme Academy is a, is a schooling process that isn't necessarily schooling. It's not from the top down. It's helping to create an environment in, the, in our classroom to let people feel uh, heard and comfortable to speak their own voice, to tell their own stories. And the idea behind what we do on stage is mirrors that. Uh, we know all the words already because they're our lives or they're your lives. So we're retelling those stories or telling our own. And the rhymes and the rhyming and the beatboxing and, and the skill set that you see comes with practice and comes with doing the show for 15 years or um, being a battle rapper for 10 years or being a beatboxer for 20 or whatever. You know, the, the, the practice is what makes it happen. But when we're on stage and when we're in the academy, we're we're essentially uh, funneling or channeling things that already exist. And it's about then fostering the community or the environment on stage where we feel um, uh, heard and comfortable to um, empower each other. Yeah, invest, don't yeah. invent. That's yeah. something yeah. that Shockwave really is uh, adamant about inside of the academy and on stage as well. I love that. I love yeah. invest, don't You invent. invest, you already know it. You don't have to invent. You don't have to tell a story about dragons if you've never met a dragon. Well, I what? have. <laughs> Dragons. Let me tell you about Smaug. <laughs> so, uh, and uh, of course, we have a graduate of the academy uh, with us as well. Was this, uh, what was that experience like? Because it, it sounds like, oh, well, he here's the book. Here's the pamphlet. And now you know how to freestyle in certificate. Yes, that's how it went down. Um, <laughs> yeah, Chris was my teacher at the academy. Uh, I took it. I took the class back in March, and uh, fast forward a few months later, I am now on Broadway, living my wildest dream. You know how it goes. <laughs> that is not the trajectory of everybody most of who takes the <laughs> class goes to Broadway. No, so sign not, up for it. That is like, not five percent of people. That is not what we're saying. No, but I mean, I was a huge fan of FLS and these guys, and. Um, so I used to go to the shows and now working with them is just incredible and it's just, it's crazy and they are very adamant about um, having each other's backs and coming into this I was terrified because I come from a musical theater background where I have a script and I have lines and blocking but um, we, we don't really have that here so I mean you're, naturally you're scared to fail um, for you know trying something for your first time but they, if everyone has your back on stage, we're a community and we, we do it together. If, if I drop something, somebody's gonna pick it up. And uh, yeah. We all have different skill sets as well and we're all uh, varying degrees of the diversity of the talent within that skill set. So uh, for instance, three quarters of the way through our show, uh, Arthur generally plays the keyboard throughout the whole show and Arthur will then come out and then sing the hook we have not heard his voice until that moment. So you as the audience are then suddenly, uh, this new talent is unveiled to you. And, and then you're like, whoa, there's a Stevie Wonder D'Angelo hybrid on stage also. <laughs> and he's got a beautiful meets voice. Meets Malcolm Gladwell. Yeah, meets, <laughs> meets Malcolm Gladwell. So that's who I am. Yeah. <laughs> uh, well, let me, let, me, uh, let me play around with that. Let, let's follow that up. Um, uh, to uh, Arthur and, um, and Kayla, there you know the show is named after one of the greatest mm -hmm. improvisers of the world, John Coltrane. Mm. Um, so, with what you're saying about like mistakes and having that support system, what is the nature of mistakes when you are on a stage with improvisers? Mm -hmm. That and improvisers, might I add, that you trust deeply. Yes, it's an interesting question. Um, there are not really many mistakes. I mean, there's, it's like there's, there's, there's this idea when you're starting that you're going, that you might make mistakes, you might fall, but the things that feel like they're going to be mistakes are the best part of the show. Yeah. Um, so you fall uh, and pick yourself up and the coming back up is the, is the most exciting thing that's happened on stage. Mm -hmm. um, and we support that musically. Um, we will often, you know, uh, so 
there are often two keyboardists in the group um, and we will sort of go in the, a direction that feels like, oh, wait, maybe we shouldn't have done that. But maybe then someone picks it up and goes, oh, now I'm dancing. <laughs> oh, great. I'm glad I did that. Um, yeah. Yeah. And I think that's what's special about this show. Um, you know, you can go see Aladdin where they're doing magic tricks and the, the stage, there's props flying and it's amazing. But in the saturated world that we live in now where everything is perfect, right? We have people who make millions of dollars and they don't write their own lyrics, they auto-tune their voice, they lip sync on stage um, and we like clap for that and we're like, yay, we're getting a half show. It's really amazing to, you know what I'm saying? It like, come on. Like our show proves that all we need is the power of ourselves and the human instruments. And it is good enough to go to a show on Broadway where it's just seven people who are truly passionate about what they love. They're talented, right? They worked hard for it and that's all you need. And it's just as good as a show as Wicked where people are flying through the air. Um, it just shows what, you know, what humans are capable of. And when we shed away, you know, you guys are Google, you have the highest technology probably in this building, but it's you guys that make that happen. It's not like these lights go on by themselves, really. You know, we need the human aspect of it. And I think that that is what the heart of our show is. It is the human aspect, and it shows where everything else comes from, all the glitter and the glam and the visual effects and the cool sound effects. Um, it started with just human beings coming together and creating that show. And I really think that's why Freestyle Love Supreme is really special, too. Like, Anissa and I are new to the mix, but this is a group of people who have been best friends for 15 years and made this happen through their commitment to each other and the craft. And I mean, for me, it's so inspiring to see like, I wonder what I'm doing now in 15 years, what the things that I'm passionate about and the things that I'm doing with my friends or maybe your coworkers, like where that idea will be in 15 years. That's really special to me to be a Broadway. part of that. Yeah. <laughs> Broadway. Yeah. I also think just as someone who doesn't do what these guys do, I think the show and the artistry of the way they work together is a metaphor really for life and a reminder to me to um, kind of go with the flow a little bit more because you realize there really is no perfect anything. And, you know, in life we learn the most from our failures or mistakes. We don't usually learn from our successes when everything lines up perfectly. It's not really where the good stuff happens, even though it feels good in the moment. The, the bigger sense of victory comes when you have really, it's like tanking and you pulled it together. And, you know, at the end of a show, maybe the cumulative effect of the show is phenomenal. Like it's a great show, but there were parts that didn't work, that did work. And you realize in life, like, that's okay. Like it's all not going to be an A plus yeah. all through. And I just feel as someone who has watched it so many times and watching what you do, it's a constant reminder to me to just kind of ride the wave a little bit, yeah. just ride it. Yeah. And there's some delicious science behind all the things we're saying as well. So can I jump into that? Is that all yeah. right? Go. Um, so there's something in, in our brains that uh, the dorsal lateral prefrontal cortex, it's the area of your brain that um, is, is responsible for effortful planning. The only reason why I know this is because I've been working with a, a neurologist and a neuroscientist out of UCSF for the last two and a half years. Uh, his name is Dr. Charles Lim. And he was obsessed with sound and how it affected your brain and your creativity. So about 10 years ago, he put beatboxers and freestyle rappers into fMRI machines. And about three years ago, uh, he and I teamed up and we got some grants from the NEA and the NIH to put improvisers and more freestylers and shockwave uh, into an fMRI machine uh, and start to see the correlative um, nature between your state of flow and your effortful planning. Now, I'm sure all of you out there are hugely successful. You're here at Google. That's amazing. Congratulations. <laughs> um, also, no big deal, TVC. OK, great. So um, <laughs> just something I do. Uh, so, so these parts of your brain, this, this effortful planning, that's generally your inner critic voice. That's, def that's the part of your brain that's basically saying, you're not good enough. Uh, perf reviews coming up. Oh my gosh, I only got three of my f major five OKRs done. I'm at like 42%. I'm supposed to be at 64%. And so you start really judging all that like muscle, like how do I work harder to do this? And then there's another part of your brain, which is the medial lateral prefrontal cortex, a little bit further forward and off to the sides. And it is basically responsible for your state of flow. And we probably have heard a little bit about some of that, the flow state and being creative and being playful. There's a lot of great books out there around it. 
And this part of your brain is that part when you are just crushing something and, and it doesn't feel like work. Time just disappears. And for some of us, it's, it's yoga. And for some of us, it's, it's coding. And for some of us, it's freestyle rapping. Uh, but there's something about it that switches these different waves in our brain. And it also, when you get to your flow state, it mutes your dorsal lateral prefrontal cortex. Now that's something that can be truly useful when you're doing a blue sky project, when you're being very creative and you want to just say yes, and you want to create an environment with a lot of psychological safety for you all, not just the guys in the room. So we've said guys a lot up here. I want to just point out when we say guys, we're using it to mean all of you, whether you associate yourself as a male, a female, middle sex, somewhere outside of that spectrum or in between, this is for everyone. This is how neuronormative and neurodiverse brains work. So what we want to do is use the skill of improv, and that's why we have the academy, and that's why I do Speechless. That's the company I have inside of Google, that we train Googlers to do more improv practice so they can get to their state of flow easier and faster and in a place where they trust everyone around them. Yeah, cheers to that. Um, I will say, yes, I, when I, people come to see the show, a lot of my friends are al always saying, I was so scared for you. I'm, and I'm, yeah, me too. I'm terrified. <laughs> this is new to me and I, I mean, but when you, when you get up on stage and you're doing that thing, it really does quiet everything else that's telling you you can't do it because you don't have time to think about what you can't do. You just gotta do it. And so, Yes, that's that. That's what I've learned is just to trust myself and just go for it. And the academy was, I mean, we had people from all different walks of life that haven't done improvisation or haven't done rapping, haven't done singing. And it was just creating a safe space where people were quieting the parts of themselves that told them that they couldn't, and then they did it. And I think that that's a yeah, that's what the academy is about. It's not about your, your your skills necessarily, but it's about just creating a space where people can come together and feel free. Yeah, and that doesn't mean that when we get off the stage, we were like, perfect. We did <laughs> no it perfectly. Way. Not I, at all. Chris no. and I will literally like come off and be like, oh, we when we meant to, like, oh, why did we do that? I did instead of oh, why? <laughs> But the difference is, even if we have those moments, all of us still come back the next day. Or we go back to the next show, um, even if it's two hours later, we'll do the next show, and we don't let that stay in our head. We're not gonna, I'm not gonna be nervous now because I <laughs> the wrong way, you know what I mean? So I think just because we're always putting ourselves in a risky situation, and sometimes the moves that we make work really well, um, sometimes we don't, uh, and then we get off and we feel like, ah, oh, all right, I'll do better next time. But what's really special too is if we have that moment where, oh, I did, and that didn't fit well, doesn't matter. These guys will go, okay, yep, that's what we're doing now. And they all support that move that you did, even if you kind of don't feel good about it, and we make it a move that is successful in the end. Yeah, failure becomes a part of our practice. Mm -hmm. Yeah, cheers to that. Yeah. Uh, so, so let me dig into that a, a little bit more. Of, of course, you all do have a director um, with with Thomas Kale. So, you know, other things that he's looking at that you've you've worked on. Uh, there is something on a piece of paper. There is an idea. There's something there that anchors that feedback. And for you, that that anchor isn't really there. There's a different kind of anchor. So, in that really supportive nurturing, safe environment that you're talking about where you get off stage and you, you're thinking about the, you know, the two million choices you just made um, and you're, you're thinking about alternate realities that could have happened, your, you know, your own second chances, if you will. Um, what's the nature of receiving and giving feedback? Because you all have clearly honed a skill, which means you must have been receiving and developing your own feedback, asking for feedback, giving feedback. But it sounds like it's a whole different animal than some, some of the uh, archetypes that people have in their head of this director yelling at people or you know getting into this one word and no, that word needs to emote more, feel it. Um, what is that feedback like when you're working with each other or, or with Thomas? Um, the feedback is not necessarily uh, ever even about the content that happens within. It's not you made a wrong choice. Generally, uh, and if not, I, I'm just not thinking of any other any other cause or any other case. Uh, it's it's the structural aspect to it. It's the types of words that we get. It's the types of choices. It's the it's the overall structural integrity of the show. Maybe we should do this instead. Maybe let's tighten it up. This went a little bit longer. How do we make it 
shorter. It's not you went too long or it's not necessarily that stuff. It's kind of uh, the, the scaffolding that gets adjusted. <laughs> Yeah, I think one thing that we haven't touched on so much is that there are sort of two levels of um, structure to the show. Not structure, but sort of two levels of how the show exists. There's this sort of wonderful bubbling goo of improv, right? Um, but then there's the framework that we pour it into. Um, so there are also two levels of feedback that can happen. There can be things like, oh, well, we got to, you know, point A in this game sooner than we wanted to. But then there can also be... Uh, we could make that choice more boldly this time. There's there's sort of two levels, and the same thing, you know, that same thing sort of applies to what happens at the academy. And when we talk about this, the work we do in general, there's always the like skill level of sort of the generalized improv, and then there's the structure we pour it all into. Hmm. Interesting. Yeah, I have to say about feedback too. There's something really interesting around the culture of feedback. So I know at Google, the the feedback here tends to be like. Well, I mean, radical candor is starting to take root in some some areas as well, uh, thanks to Google employees. Um, and it can be totally misused <laughs> as well. There's a lot of danger around radical candor if it's not sort of doled out in the way that it was meant and or intended. Um, but really what you're talking about is like warm feedback and cool feedback. And by warm feedback, I mean, what's serving us well? What's going well? And then cool feedback, what can we do better next time? And what's really important as you, as an individual, you can tell others what kind of feedback you need. That's something that you can do. A lot of times we give away our agency around feedback. And so something that I think is hugely important can be, hey, I, I've been struggling lately and I'm not feeling that great or confident about my ability. I need some warm feedback. I need some people to just tell me some of the things that are going right. Uh, and so I can keep heading in that direction. Often the feedback we get that we really obsess over, and this is humans because we're problem solving machines, is the bad stuff, right? It's the stuff that we didn't do well or where we came up short because we're always trying to get better. Um, and for us, and I think what, what Kaiser Rose is saying over there is that there's a certain amount of you're full and you're already good enough exactly as you are. Um, I will say that I get a lot, I get caught in the rhyming. I'm seduced by the rhyming of it all. And a note that I got a lot was stop being focused on that. Tell the story. And so that definitely freed me in a way. Um, it, you can't be scared to not rhyme. What we're trying to do is tell a story to people. And I thought that that was really great advice. Uh with this theme of making mistakes and uh, you know the, these glorious things of improv, sometimes you see someone do the the bleep instead of the bloop, and and someone else picks it up. Uh, I, I'm sure you have uh, can reach back into the archives and think of uh, sh share one of those stories of you know one of these little things that led to a bigger thing. <laughs> yeah, well, we were at the United Nations. <laughs> Already love it. Yeah. Yeah, I don't think you do. <laughs> and uh, yeah, and, see, and that's it. Just imagine what happens next. Yeah. No, and uh, and there's a bunch of kids from all over the world in the audience, and we're doing a show for uh, the children of like the diplomats and and the people from who are representing the country at the United Nations. <laughs> and someone sh and, and we did the song called "What Y'all Know," which is basically like each one of us feels like, oh, okay, cool. This is like my my superpower. I have a I I'm a super comic book nerd. So just anyone can shout out anything about comic books, and I'll be able to run with. It. And for me, I'm a big fan of like geography and the world and history. And, and so uh, we, I asked for a city anywhere in the world and someone shouted out Dubai. And I confused it with Darfur. <laughs> and I did an entire rap about the South Sudanese needing, and this was before South Sudan was a country and, you know, the Muhajrabi and like went into all this stuff and all the kids were like, what the hell <laughs> is he talking about? And that is like, I mean, that, that's one of those lives in lore stories. And a couple kids came up to me and they're like, oh, that was so great how you commented on, you know, the opposite of what Dubai is, which is this very wealthy. <laughs> so I was like, yep, that's exactly what I was doing. So that's a, that's a pretty. <laughs> one time I did a show, uh, came out and I was like, yes, Tuesday night, we're living it. It's, it's crazy. Like did a whole rap. And then after. <laughs> I think U2K was like, 
on the microphone. It's Monday. Okay, so <laughs> she said and it like seven I times. I said it seven Make times. Some noise, Tuesday night. I was like, what's up, everybody? It's Tuesday, Tuesday. And then No one no one responded. And then <laughs> And so throughout the show, the guys kept making fun of me and like brought it back until the very end of the show. Sorry, everybody, it's Tuesday night. And so, yeah, I mean, the audience was with us and everyone was laughing the whole time because I'm an idiot and I don't know what day it is. But, Stop it. You know. I've turned it into a game. Exactly. <laughs> yeah, I think the thing about that story is that they were making fun of her at the beginning, but by the end, it was just a fun part of the show yeah. that was no longer <laughs> directed in any, in any way. Yeah. That speaks to if the it's only a mistake if you make it a mistake. Yeah. Yeah. You make a mistake, do it harder. Do it again, do it again. You create a pattern. There are no wrong notes. Mm -hmm. A little bit like the Miles Davis quote, a wrong note. A wrong note only becomes one by the note that follows it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Play a wrong note three times and it becomes right. Right? Yeah. It's like... Quick lightning round. If there was one show on Broadway, any staple that you want to see completely improvised, that you'd be willing to perform in as well, um, in 2020, what would it be? Turn one of the shows. Turn a current show or even a show. Any from show. The past. Any, any show. Any Broadway show. Turn any Broadway show into a, a freestyle rap show. <laughs> the only caveat is that you do have to perform in it. Oh, okay. Okay. Oh, okay. Wicked. Ooh. It would be wicked, man. I do it. <laughs> All right. I don't know, Phantom? <laughs> Who would you play? Yeah. I don't know, the, the ghost guy? <laughs> <laughs> Have you ever well seen Phantom? Yeah, I've it's going it. well. I don't know. I don't know. Improvising the, the casting Phantom? and the characters as well. Um, I'm going with Little Shop of Horrors, and I would play the plant. Oh, well, well, Definitely playing the plant. I don't know. Sunday in the Park with George? I don't know. <laughs> I'll be George, though. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, uh, my fair lady. <laughs> Eliza. Uh, <laughs> what I find fascinating is that you uh, make up things to suggestions in a box uh, in a split second, but this actually took a while. We took I, I don't seriously. even know if that's my answer. I just, said, answer. I just said Sunday in the park with George. <laughs> <laughs> okay, let's, let's take a question over here. My question is a request. Can you do a few more words? <laughs> yeah, maybe on the outro. We'll maybe on the way we'll out. save some time at the end. Yeah. Okay, yeah. thanks. Thank you. You rock. <laughs> we love you. Uh, let's go over here. Great. So you guys talked a little bit about practice, but I'm curious about training. Have you all had any formal training, or have you trained your minds to think in rhymes or improve your beatboxing over time? Was that a rhyme? Yeah. It was. Oh. Every, everybody's a rapper, rapper. You're in the group. <laughs> I was yeah, yeah, we'll train, we'll train. Um, I grew up playing percussion, so the rhythm was always there, and then improv from high school on. So those kind of things for me have melded my mind. Um, I have a small story on the power of practice in this group, which is that uh, we warm up before the show by doing, uh, you know, freestyling, like little bits, passing it back and forth. And historically, it was just the rappers that did this. Um, and every once in a while, they would try to make Shockwave and I do it. And we'd be like, Ugh, and we'd kind of not be able to do it. <laughs> and then one day, about two years ago, uh, we were at a gig. And right before the gig, one of them pointed to me and made me do it a little bit. And I was terrified. And I was like, oh, my God. But it was so fun. And then every gig after that, they made me do it. It was just, the one, just a little bit before each show. And two years later, I'm like, actually can kind of do it. Mm -hmm. He's yep. nasty. Yeah. Just Don't be yeah. humble. You're Training. awesome now. Jeannie, was that the Met? That was South Africa. Oh, Cape Town. Yeah, yeah it was Cape Town. Oh, great. Cape Town. Cape Town. <laughs> I, I liken it to a foreign language. Uh, once you uh, immerse yourself enough in freestyling, it, you start dreaming in it. Um, and so if you immerse yourself in a, in a foreign uh, language and you're like living in a different country, once you acquire the language enough, I think you can start to occasionally have dreams in that language. Uh, it's also a little bit like the game Tetris, if anyone has played that. And then at night you see the boxes in your mind. It's the same thing with fitting the word into the right slot. I had a few two dots dreams at one point. <laughs> uh, then I stopped. Yeah. Nice. Yeah, I think, at least for beatboxing, there was no, like, schooling. I just annoyed everyone around me and would make <laughs> fart noises and, like, experiment. But I think what's really cool about the human instrument is it's with you all the time. Like, I beatbox 
all the time. I'm on the subway. She does. I mean, yeah, I'm really sorry. Like she has to share a room with me. She has to share a room Fine. with me. And the other day I was just going like I have lots no, of videos. Cool yeah, <laughs> like just trying to find new sounds. It's so um, weird. But it's cool because it's with you all the time, you know? So it's like we have the opportunity to practice at every moment. Thanks yeah. for the question. Yes. That's, no, it's, I, I mean, I'm from a musical theater background, um, did a lot of singing growing up, and so that's I'm musically trained. Um, freestyled as a joke in high school. My name, Young Niece, is from high school. People know me that from home. Um, and so, yeah, doing it in this setting was really crazy. And just doing it over and over again, we, a lot of reps and learning how to work with others and uplift others has been really cool. Yeah. Awesome. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> so there's a point in the show where you're picking an audience member to come up on stage. <laughs> Maybe you see yep. what's going. One of the things you say is like, it shouldn't be your birthday. <laughs> <laughs> what's up with that? <laughs> What a great question. So at the end of the show, we bring an audience volunteer up and we interview them about their day. And uh, we have some rules about who we bring up on stage. And here are the rules. First, you should have done something in your day. <laughs> uh, it should be interesting, maybe slightly out of the ordinary for you. Second. Amazing how many people don't follow it's, that Yeah, it's very true. Second, you should have interacted with at least three to five other people than the people in your head. Not that there's anything wrong with the people in your head. We love them. It just gives us characters to play inside of the day. Uh, third, you have to be of voting age or older, and we have brought kids up, uh, and we'll leave it at that. Uh, and then finally, the last rule is, it shouldn't be your birthday. And here's why. When your expectation is, this day is about me, and I'm being celebrated, and I wanna have the best day of my life, they're coming up there with a lot of expectations. And then the audience equally has very high expectations because they want this person's birthday to be special and unique. That's what birthdays are supposed to be. And it always is not. <laughs> Every single time, their day is, is they, they've spent their day waiting to come to our show instead of living their life because usually birthday is like a little bit of a pause. Um, and so it actually, it helps to make sure that we filter the right person to come up on stage. So you guys talked a little bit about, you know, times you've made a mistake, you said the wrong word, you didn't rhyme, you, you know, sang the wrong note, whatever. I was curious if, if it often happens that you just draw a blank and have nothing, like you're supposed to be rapping about some word you pulled out of the bucket and you just, you just got nothing. <laughs> yep. <Yeah>, um... <laughs> happened to me uh, one time we were doing true which is when we sit on some stools and get intimate with the audience and tell a true story and uh, Anthony here picked dichotomy and I just didn't know if I remembered what it meant and I looked at him and said I was supposed to go first and I looked at him and said you're gonna have to go first and I switched stools with him and he was like okay yep and he sat down and he did his verse and through his verse he told me what it meant because that's the beauty of the show and then I was able to tell my own story. <laughs> but yeah, absolutely. I think the interesting thing there is that if you draw a blank, it doesn't mean the show has drawn a blank. Mm. So the infrastructure of our show, there's b music is being made up. Every song, every key that is being struck is all, it's all being, it's genesis. And so if you feel like it's the seventh day and you need to rest, it's okay. There are five, six other people on stage that will be busy on Monday through Saturday. Mm. If that's the way it works for some people, or Shabbos, whatever, you know, you get what I'm saying. In the uh, beginning of the show, there's a, a beatbox solo, a highlight where we either together or individually get a chance to perform. And that is uh, not inspired by a word. So you're generally, it's easier to kind of go somewhere if you have an, have an inspiration. There's a little bit of a fence that you can run along. But this is just, our show starts with a beat. And then there's a spotlight on you, and you got to do something. So the greatest part about that is that we get to just completely improvise that moment. Um, but there's an aspect to it that you have to kind of let the audience know that it's being improvised. Because, uh, but we, you don't get a word. So there's an aspect to that solo that requires us to be a little bit loosey-goosey with it. Uh, it's not a rehearsed solo we're not flexing our strongest skills and continually in the right order and whatnot so at that point sometimes your mind is just completely blank and you're in the spotlight and you just kind of have to do something so you just start with something and i didn't know what 
I was going to do right, right there, you know. But you just make a sound, and then it kind of something else will always come next. Time. Yeah, I always feel like confidence isn't walking into a room and being like Madonna and like perfect and like infallible, right? Like for me, confidence <laughs> is just the ability to continue mm -hmm. no matter what's happening. So a lot of times we'll be like, uh. Trinidad, Trinidad, I don't know about Trinidad. What does that make me think of? I don't know, I don't know. Like just, instead of just shutting down, it's like working through that not knowing and seeing where that takes you and trusting that maybe for this second you don't know, but in four seconds from now, if you just like keep those synapses firing, you'll get to that point that you need or figure it out. Yeah, the moment that I stopped being nervous about doing this show was the moment that I realized that when I didn't know what to say, it was still gonna work out. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And then everything was, oh yeah, that's fine. Should be the title of your autobiography. <laughs> yes. So good. It's a very long title. <laughs> Just pick a part of it, but yeah, moment. There's that thing that uh, some some painters have said when they have the blank canvas. That's the terrifying part. So they just paint a bunch of crap on it that later they'll paint so over I'm just to finished. make a first step. It sounds like there's uh, a similar practice in every art. Just take a step, mm -hmm. right? Yes. Hello. Thanks for coming. Uh, I was wondering if you could talk about what it's been like working with Wayne Brady, uh, specifically Wayne. with his improvisation <laughs> skills, and if there's any memorable moments. Wayne is the best. It's crazy um, working with him because I've watched him on TV my whole life, and he's just the nicest dude, very friendly man. And uh, yeah, he could do everything that we can all do, but in one person. <laughs> <laughs> so he's a superhero. He is Voltron of one. <laughs> Our show has uh, three basic tracks of the vocalists, and Mike One is the hosting person uh, who has the rapport with the audience and crowd work and whatnot. And Mike Two is sort of generally the rapper, uh, the rapper of rappers, uh, I guess. Point guard. Yeah, the point guard. And uh, Mike Three is the the singer rapper who has who has a voice. And through our run with us, he played with us in DC, he's here with us on Broadway, he has done all three of those tracks to um, a high degree of success. Chocolate bars. Chocolate bars. <laughs> oh, that's his new MC name. He just, just came up with it like. <laughs> yes. Yeah, that's his new it, MC name, Chocolate Bars. It used to bars. be 100% chance of Wayne. That's true. It's also great. <laughs> uh, a real quick story about Wayne in, in DC. He was doing shows with us at the Kennedy Center and um, yeah, we got we got the word. Uh, I think it was union, uh, and he did this amazing rap about the Civil War uh, and about him as a, a son of an immigrant from Trinidad um, and what it meant. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> these things they happen, uh, and you know, what it's meant to be a black man in the United States and how the Union Army uh, in some way, shape, or form made a tectonic shift uh, for the black experience in the United States uh, and that most art, <laughs> most amazing art, um, comes from black people. And so the union that he found himself in, it just, let's be honest, it does. <laughs> uh, anything that's like amazing in the world, probably a black person made it. Um, so, so he had this chance to kind of like just, you know, have a beautiful moment with the audience around like the history of, of his experience as a black man in the United States. And, you know, our show, while it's on the surface, a comedy freestyle rap show, it has these moments of great depth to it as well. And to hear Wayne Brady, who is the king of improv, have a moment where he shared his vulnerable heart around what it means to keep making art in this day and age as a black man, uh, that to me is like the best thing that is uh, that Freestyle Love Supreme is capable of doing. Before we shift and start winding down, there was this beautiful moment on, on Monday night um, from Scented Candles, which started at, as, as the worst road trip of all time. <laughs> and then uh, at the end, we were all thinking about 9-11 mm -hmm. and we were all right there from comedy to tragedy. And, um, and what I appreciated about it is that we were brought along gently as well. Um, so thank you for that. First of all, saw the show, amazing. I just have to repeat it. It's been said many times, but it's true. <laughs> thank you. Um, also, I second the request from the person earlier. More, more. More rapping, please. <laughs> 
Uh, but the, the actual question is maybe related to the previous question. What are the, let's say, requirements that you impose on the guests? Um, and what are the challenges in working with them, right? Presumably they haven't necessarily spent the last 15 years freestyling or freestyling with you. And so how do you make that work as well as it does? Uh, some of our guests that we've had, we, we help them to shine through what they do best. We've had uh, Sarah Kay is a, an amazing poet who we've known for years, but she's not a rapper. Uh, she did a, uh, an improvised poem on stage. So we help, we mold our show. We kind of, because we can, um, create the, the divot for her to sit in and shine as herself. Mm -hmm. We had Ian McKellen and Helen Mirren on stage last I mean, week. Whatever. Um, whatever, just that. <laughs> nice, nice. Uh, and we created sort of a, a love battle for the two of them where there was an interview that happened and then embodying them and then telling each other how much they love each other. So that was a, a, a new thing that we've never done before. So we have the ability really to do anything with anybody on stage. And love and generosity being the guiding principles. Yeah, yeah that too. Also, when you put it that way, anything with anybody, it sounds slightly ominous. But <laughs> <laughs> We're a bit of an adaptogenic, it's true. Yeah. Okay, and maybe this will kick us into a, a, a rap with some more words. Yeah, yeah. yeah I was wondering, um, what are the origin stories of your guys' nicknames? All right, I guess I'll start, because that's my part. I made a huge mistake when I was trying to <laughs> introduce Arthur the Geniuses. Check it out. I didn't know his last name. He came in. I just met him that night. And Lynn was like, he works at the Tech Serve, which is pre-Apple Store days. He's a Mac Genius Bar, basically. And he also went to Yale for music composing. All right, so I was supposing on stage in that exact moment, what am I going to call this human being? OK, I have some choosing. I'm not the St. Regis's, so I brought him in. I called him Arthur the, the Geniuses, because genius he's two kinds of genius. That's how he got his name. True? True. <laughs> All right. Okay. So I was listening to this song by this girl, Young B, and she came on the mic and she was like, see, it's Young B on the track, so it was about to be crazy. And I was like, okay, okay, baby. So I took that and I went to school the next day and I was like, hey, everybody, hey, 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 it's Young Niece on the track, so it was about to be crazy. Rich girl, that's me. Okay, baby. Money on my mind and blah, blah, blah. And I was spitting, everybody was like, ha, ha, ha. And so people started calling me Young Niece. And now I rap over the beat. <laughs> ah. Oh, gosh. He already told my story. Yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah, I don't know your story. story. Oh, well, yeah, yes, I do. Yeah, you know oh, shit. Wait. shit. Okay. Uh, there was a Transformer thing that happened one time, and then I'm going to say something else that rhymes. I think maybe his name was Soundwave. That's right. He was a cassette guy who did some thing. I don't know the story. <laughs> He was at UMass at Mission Improbable. It was improbable that he would do the acapella. So yeah, this white fella started making some beats and everybody like was, oh, God damn, that's sweet. And the next person on who was a Transformer fan, he was like, give it up for my man. His name is Shockwave instead of Soundwave because Soundwave's superior constructed God's inferior. But anyway, if you watch the movie Transformers, you might know what I am referring to. That is how Shock got his name and that was like 19... 99? 98? A Kaiser Rose is very, very much more recent, yeah? It's true, because honestly, I don't know how to name myself. It's just not in my vision. It's just not with my wealth. It's a thing that I can never do. I did have a beatbox name, but I had to drop it because it was a bird and it made no sense. So I came to rehearsals and everyone had nicknames and they were like, okay, Arthur the geniuses and Shockwave and Kayla. <laughs> we gotta give you a name. So I sat down with Anthony and he said, what do you fancy see? He said, tell me a story. So I told him a story about this old sandwich I would make with my grandma, which is a genius invention. And I can't tell you because you will all steal it. <laughs> I'm not going to tell you what it is. But somehow through that story, I got the name Kaiser Rose. Right, right, right. 
uh -huh. like a Kaiser <laughs> bun. Anyway, she's not the only one. All right, so we're going to have some fun. Because Two Touch came from a form of improv I created in 99 with another improvisational troupe find. They were called the Pedestrians, based on a review that the New York Times gave to Tommy Kale for his first show that he ever did direct. All right, now I came correct. And what we did, we asked for cassette, cassette tapes. This is how long ago it was. Or CDs, or maybe the first iPod. And a person in the audience would give us music. And we was like, God, we would play it and then recreate it with our voices. And then later in the show, we would make a second choices. Like think BBC anthology of the Beatles. All right, yes. And so we did like a second alt take a Hey Jude. And then they were singing, that's a pretty good job. Hey dude, you should probably do a second touch to that song. So we probably called it Two Touch not too long after that. And that's how I got my name too. I learned a lot. Yeah, I feel Jenny, different. I want to thank you so much for believing in this show. And yes. Yes. Uh, let's hear it for Ars Nova. Ars Nova. You, yeah, if you haven't seen shows at Ars Nova or if you're not a supporter or a fan, run, don't walk. They put on the best shows, and those shows generally end up in very big stages. You know, The Great Comet is, is just one example, but there's so many shows that are spectacular and life-changing because they look for unique voices, and Ars Nova's work is just the best. We all love them very much. Thank you. And thank you all for coming and blessing us at Google and sharing your stories and teaching us kind of how to show up, if I can say. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.